what beat me in those five were the following. Uh, some are obvious to you, but uh, inoculation did beat me when the uh, workforce was prepared, when the union did not defend itself beat me because that translated to solidarity. Rage beat me, and when I say rage, when inoculation is put in force with employees and they see it come true, it creates a feeling of rage. How could the company be doing something like this? You know, I, I never thought they had it in them. And that rage translates to a solidarity, which also beat me because it, uh, that kind of solidarity, especially solidarity that's instigated by rage, is next to impossible to penetrate. And what beat me the most, the most effective weapon you have to bust a union buster is exposure. Exposure to the point of overexposure. And that's where I want to get into a discussion with you for the balance of this presentation. I don't want to be cute with words, but union busters do not know how to deal with the light of day. Uh, there are two types of union busters in campaigns. There's the type that I used to be. I was behind the scenes. So if the workforce saw me, they just knew I was some advisor in some executive office off to the side, and I didn't make myself available or accessible. Uh, as the field has grown, uh, there are more and more of what I call the direct third-party persuaders. And these are consultants and or attorneys who talk directly to the proposed bargaining unit employees. Uh, I know when I was uh, working behind the scenes, almost every client that I sold business to, when I told that client uh, that their supervisors would be my mouthpieces and my ears and all these things, uh, they got bent out of shape. They would call their supervisors grunts and probably pro-union, and I needed to be the spokesperson, and I had to argue with them that I was only temporary and that it was important for the uh, supervisors, because they'd be there for the long haul, to be the principal communicators and whatever con I could give them so I didn't have to be a persuader. Uh, and today, because the field has grown uh, to such huge proportions, there are many firms that do both. They work the supervisors because that is the fundamental basis of union busting, but they also talk directly to the employees and persuade. So where I'm going to start as far as exposure, uh, and hopefully most of you already know of this, and so be it, I'll just rehash it for you. When I talked about the Landrum-Griffin Act, the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act, that requires you to file as a matter of public record your LM2s, your LM3s, your Constitution and bylaws with the United States Department of Labor, well, when Landrum-Griffin was passed, it also had a provision for anti-union consultants, although they're referred to as persuaders. And the definition of a persuader is someone who is representing the employer, who engages directly with bargaining unit or proposed bargaining unit employees to persuade their union attitude one way or the other. Under Landrum Griffin, or the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act, people who engage in persuader activity also have a filing responsibility. When someone engages in persuader activity, a union buster, we'll call him, uh, he is required by the Landrum Griffin Act to file what is known as Form LM-20, Form LM-20 is a campaign-by-campaign campaign or case-by-case case financial report that uh, once the employer and the buster have agreed to terms, those terms must be disclosed in Form LM-20. Uh, uh, I saw one, for example, uh, in uh, Las Vegas where I live, a few years ago, the table game dealers attempted to form a union. And uh, some of the best union busters 
in the country, the Burke Group, somebody who was local to Las Vegas, uh, were brought in. And I saw the LM-20 of a fellow by the name of Mark Garrity, who was kind of the dark prince of union busting in Las Vegas. And on his LM-20 for the MGM Grand, which had about 800 table game dealers, he reported that for two months' work, which is how long he represented the MGM Grand, he was paid $1.6 million. Now, that in and of itself might sound a bit outrageous for two months' work, but I'm telling you this story because this Mark Garrity, who I'm using as an example, uh, he calls his union busting firm Balance Incorporated, also engages in persuader activity. So he works the supervisors and he works the employees. From my experience and knowledge of union busting, when somebody does both, they work the supervisors and they persuade with the workers, it is two-thirds supervisor work and one-third persuasion. That's, that's how the one who wears both hats operates and how he did. And I know as a fact, because of some of my labor contacts in Las Vegas, that he actually received for those two months six million dollars. But he only had to report what he was paid for his persuader activity, which was 1.6 million. He did not have to report, based on a legal precedent, the advice he gave for management. But Form LM20, and I want to go over these forms specifically before I take it further, uh, must be filed, uh, I believe, it's within 30 days of the arrangement between the employer and the persuader. Um, the other fo there are two other forms I want to make mention of. There is what's called form LM21. LM21 is the equivalent of your LM2. It's an annual report that busters who engage in persuader activity must file with the Department of Labor as a matter of public record. Uh, and the third form that you should be aware of is called Form LM-10. Form LM-10 is required to be filed by the employer. So the employer is not off the hook. Uh, and it, it's filed on a case-by-case -case basis, just like the LM-20. So it better reflect comparable numbers because failure to file uh, or uh, misstatement. The Department of Labor has teeth where the NLRB does not. And uh, uh, violating Landrum Griffin by persuaders could lead them into some very, very, very deep diarrhea, I, I can assure you, because I've seen it happen and I've helped make it happen. Now, why is this important for you to know? If you're facing a persuader, and you know his name, and if, he, if he's out in the open, it's not hard to get his name. What I suggest you do is have your legal counsel in your region or your local uh, who's familiar with the law pick up the phone and call the United States Department of Labor. You can do it yourself. You don't need your attorney to do it. And when I make the LM-20 that's filed, or if there already is one, available to the people that I'm organizing. Not only does it counter the LM-2, it drowns it. Because now your prospective members are seeing what their employer who is pleading poverty and he can't afford to even keep them, let alone give them raises, is paying some terrorist a million bucks to manipulate them, to twist the truth, 